Yes, I've been roughly two and a half years in, in, in Armenia. And I think this is my 12th AOA uh, lecture. The background of these lectures is that in the last six, seven years in Shell, I was asked to make a presentation on stakeholder engagement, especially in the Middle East. It became a hit. I think I made it 45 times, 45 times inside Shell and outside it. So when I retired, I wrote 45 learnings based on 65 or 60 real life stories I lived through. And the learnings are successes or failures we had in, in Shell and in, in deals or, or in stakeholder management. And uh, I made a presentation for these lectures from the US at George Washington University to Moscow Skolkovo uh, Business School. And many times, as I mentioned at AUA. So that's the background. The, the book is not published because it has about six, seven stories which are confidential to Shell. I don't want to go into a legal problem. I have one quick disclaimer is that I'm going to magnify certain situations in order to make the point, not exaggerate. And I have a couple of statements. <laughs> uh, this first statement is that there's no rocket science. You can use a lot of the learnings on your brother, sister, father, mother. I use them on my two boys. It's no rocket science. It's a kind of the stories empower you to use them at the right time. So whatever I learned from it, from the story may apply differently to you. So it's a matter of for you to think through it. Rafi, so, before you continue, let me just offer you the following. So it's actually possible to use Zoom where you're actually embedded in the presentation rather than as a separate window, if you prefer to do it that way. That's OK. Um, OK. So far, so good. <laughs> So my next quick slide is about Shell. In order to, to understand the stories, I was asked to really give context. So Shell is still the largest energy company in the world. And, and Shell is in a transition now from an oil and gas company to a really renewable biofuel or hydrogen net zero emissions business. So it's a very difficult moment where Shell will go from emitting a lot of CO2 to emitting none. Uh, to, to make a couple of, of points here, uh, it, Shell is very customer oriented and we become even more customer oriented. So I, I always have this question I ask, who is the company that sells most hamburgers in the world? It's not McDonald's, it's Shell. Who's the company that sells most coffee in the world? That's not Starbucks, that's Shell, because Shell, as you can see on the right hand, has 30,000 customers and 46 retail stations. We have none here, and we'll have 55,000 of those. So the customer interface of Shell is very high, and the brand of Shell is worth $42 billion. So the logo brings trust to the customer. Uh, Starbucks and McDonald's will have around 30 to 35,000 outlets. And just a fun fact, if you look at machines around the world, 11% of all engines around the world, be it cars, airplanes, factory machines, all run on shell lubricants. 11% will be 13% by 2025, just to show you Shell was the number one company in the world from World War II to 1996. Uh, and uh, after that, there were Amazon, you know, and Google and so on. So maybe it's number nine. I'm not putting the 2020 statistics. It should be very bad. So let's stay on the good statistics of 2020. So by, after anchoring this, my first, I will have a one uh, learning. And then we go to a video. So let me prepare you for that. So the learning is just to show you where I came up with the world, do not fly blind, with the title, the title of the book. And each learning will have the story underneath. It says it happened in October, 2001, you can see it. And it happened in Saudi Arabia. And the project I was dealing with was called Core Venture One in Saudi Arabia. And I was sent from London uh, to do a review, an audit about this project. This was a, a $10 billion project, 50% ExxonMobil, 
30% Shell, 10% BP, 10% Philips. And my job was to check if the commercial side was going well. And when I call value, value assurance review two, meaning it's gate two, that means the project team has spent $88 million and they needed $250 million to, get, to go to gate three, and then another $250 million to, get, to go to gate four, and then they can, the project can happen at $10 billion. So if, they, if the project team does not satisfy certain requirements at gate two, then they cannot go to gate three. So my job was to really check the commercial side. So I interviewed the commercial leader. The commercial leader in ExxonMobil, uh, I said, how are the negotiations going? And he said, oh, it's terrible. It's Saudi Aramco, the Saudis are so difficult. Are we having, we are not progressing. We have so many issues. I said, so, so let, me, let me help you. So how do you do the negotiations? Oh, he said, we, um, we sit on a, this big room. We have a table, a large table. Uh, eight come from the other side, from Saudi Aramco. And we are eight from ExxonMobil, Americans. And we have one guy from Shell, one from BP, one from Philips sitting in the back because they're chief negotiator, they are in, in the lead. So I said, you know, um, how often do you have coffee with the guys on the other side? And they said, coffee? I said, no coffee, lunch, dinner, orange juice, anything. How often do you meet the Saudis one-on-one -on -one or two two by two just to find out what they think? We don't do that, he said. You don't do that. I said, you, you, you always hear the highest tax rate from the tax person because he wants to show he's very, very powerful. You know, this is point three. But individually, he knows if they impose the high tax rate, the project will collapse. The capital expenditure guy is coming with you know, very low capital expenditure, you know it's going to cost more. So, but if you talk one-on-one, -on -one, you can find out how they feel. And during the meeting, you can turn the conversation to be more in your favor instead of always these guys coming against you. Oh, he said, no, no, we will not drink coffee. I will not have lunch with these guys. So after one hour, I told the guy, I think you're flying blind, you will crash. No doubt, within six months. Six months later, the project crashed. $88 million were wasted. 22 American families have to fly home from Saudi Arabia to America. Now, maybe even if a lot of coffee drinking had happened, they would have crashed still, but there was no chance to have a deal when people were not talking separately, individually, especially in this part in the, in the Middle East to really feel the emotions and what will make it work. So that's where do not fly blind came up.